بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad where we've been exploring in elaborate detail the life of the messenger from the pre-Islamic era and we aim to examine and study his life up until uh, the day of his demise. Now, we've been speaking about some of the most important events that took place in the life of the Prophet ﷺ before the commencement of his prophetic mission at the age of 40. And we spoke about the Prophet's activism in his 20s. We spoke about the type of work that he did, uh, his interactions with uh, his, his uncle, his trips to Syria uh, during the uh, the trading expeditions. And, you know, arguably one of the most important incidents in the life of the Prophet before his prophetic mission is uh, his marriage to Khadija alayhi salam. Now, who, who was Khadija? Now, Khadija, of course, she is the daughter of Khuwaylid. She was a resident of Mecca, and she belonged to the same tribe as the Prophet. So she belongs to the tribe of Quraysh. And in fact, uh, on the screen, you could see that, uh, you know, I, 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 we have Khadija's pedigree. When, when you look at her ancestral line, you see that Khadija and the Prophet are related. You know, so Khadija's father is Khuwaylid whose father is Asad, whose father is Abdul Uzza, whose father is Qusay. So you see that Khadija and the Prophet وآله, they share a common ancestor about, you know, four to five generations, uh, uh, you know, back. So they're from the same tribe and they are distantly uh, related uh, to one another. Now Khadija was held in high esteem by the Meccans uh, because of her exemplary character and her business savviness. And I think that this is something that's remarkable considering that Khadija السلام, is living in a world uh, which is uh, you know, toxically misogynistic. And it's a world where if you're female, you're lucky to survive. And when you examine the biography of Khadija, you see that not only did she survive in that world, but she actually flourished. And she commanded the respect of her people. And in the same way that the Prophet ﷺ had a reputation for his noble character, we know that even before he began his prophetic mission, the Meccans, the Quraysh, those who knew him, they gave him the honorific titles of As-Sadiq Al-Amin, the, the truthful one, the trustworthy one. Similarly, Khadija السلام, also uh, was renowned for her noble character to the extent that she was called Al-Tahira, the pure one. And again, this is significant, especially considering that, you know, that you know, the, in Mecca and, and uh, the surrounding regions, you know, some women were 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 not known for their uh, for their modesty and uh, and their decency. So in that culture, you see where you know oftentimes where where relations between the opposite genders are a bit loose, you see that she preserves her her modesty and her dignity, and she becomes known. For uh, for her no, for her nobility, and she's she's recognized as, and she's given the title of al Tahira. She was also known, uh, you know, because of her business savviness. She was known as Amira Tujar, the princess of the merchants. She was a, a successful businesswoman, and you know she inherited money uh, from her father. And she basically turned 
that inheritance into a fortune uh, because of her, uh, her business acumen. Now, whenever the caravans left Mecca or returned to Mecca, people noted that the caravan of Khadija was larger in volume. She had more goods and more merchandise than all of the other caravans combined. So, you know, this is a woman who it would she would be the equivalent of someone who's running, you know, a multi-billion dollar company today. So, so she her caravans were known as being the largest her business generated the the uh, the greatest uh, revenue, but she always she always maintained that humility and that decency and that purity, and uh, and she was respected uh, by all of her peers. In fact, you know, despite the fact, even though she controlled this uh, this, she was at the helm of this business. She she would not mix and mingle with men. You know, she would appoint agents to conduct her business for her. And therefore, you see that even though she is the wealthiest, uh, she doesn't brush shoulders with men in the marketplaces. Uh, she's able to, to generate, uh, you know, astronomical revenue and really manage uh, her business uh, from afar. Now, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was 25 years old, his uncle, Abu Talib, suggested to Khadija, because, you know, the families knew each other. He suggested to Khadija that she should consider making Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi her partner, her business partner in one of her caravans, which was preparing to leave uh, for Syria. Now, incidentally, we find that Khadija was actually in need. She was looking for someone to manage uh, the caravan of goods that was preparing to leave Mecca for Syria. So the timing was perfect, and uh, Khadija extends the offer to the Prophet ﷺ, not to be uh, her employee, but rather to be her business partner. So it was a, it was a partnership. It was a mudaraba between the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija. Now, Khadija, she appoints her servant. She had a servant by the name of Maysara. And she requests Maysara to accompany the Prophet ﷺ as his aid uh, during this, uh, this trading uh, expedition. So the trading expedition to Syria, when you look at uh, the historical accounts, you find that that particular trip where the Prophet ﷺ was managing the caravan of Khadija as a partner generated unprecedented profits. That was the most lucrative uh, commercial expedition uh, in Khadija's business uh, career. Now, during this journey, the Prophet ﷺ took a similar route uh, to the route that uh, he would take with his uncle when he was younger. You know, if, if you recall, this is not the first time the Prophet ﷺ makes this journey to Syria. He was familiar with the routes to Syria. And when Maysara was with him, you know, they took the same routes that he would take when he was younger with Abu Talib. And they stopped at Busra, which is a village that is near Damascus. At that village, you find that there is a Christian monk, Nestor, who observes the, the Prophet He observes Muhammad from afar, and he confides in Maysara that this young merchant, you know, because the prophet was, you know, in his mid twenties, you know, maybe maybe twenty four years old at the time, twenty five years old, he says to him that this young merchant, this young man, is destined to be a prophet. So you see that you have a number of 
Christian monks. You have a number of people from different faith traditions that observe certain signs in the Prophet that indicate to them that this is the promised messenger of God that we find, that we read about in our scriptures. And, you know, they note that they would always see this cloud uh, shielding him and protecting him from the rays of the sun, among, among the other signs that they saw. Now, upon returning to Mecca, Maysara uh, tells Khadija uh, about the, the enormous profits that they were able to make. And he also tells her about Nestor's prediction, the prediction of the, uh, the Christian monk. And of course, Khadija found this to be intriguing. Now, Khadija's cousin, her paternal cousin, Waraka ibn Nawfal, uh, who was a Christian himself, she shares with him the story that, uh, that Maysara shared with her, and he actually corroborated the monk's prophecy. He says that there is something special and unique about this young man. Among the things that uh, Maysara mentions, so when Maysara returns, you know, uh, he's basically debriefing uh, Khadija, giving her kind of a, uh, uh, a report about what he saw, about what happened uh, during the trip. One of the things that he notes about the Prophet Sallallahu is that he says that this Muhammad is the most truthful man I've ever met in my entire life. He's a man of great integrity, meaning that this money that he was able to make, he did not generate this revenue. He didn't, he didn't make these sales because he was manipulative or because he omitted the truth. He was truthful. He was honest. And he was able, everything that he touched had barakah. So he highlights the, the truthfulness and the integrity of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And this is really a rare quality in, in business, you know, among merchants, you know, we know, you know, from our own experiences that, you know, uh, that businessmen, that, that, that sales, salesmen sometimes, you know, if they don't lie, they might in, omit the truth, they might embellish. But Maysara says that, that Muhammad, I observed him and he is, you know, uh, he has, uh, he is a man of impeccable character, a man of truthfulness, a man of honesty. And he does not cheat anyone. He never omits the uh, the truth. Now, when Khadija hears this, she hears the the, the prophecies uh, from uh, about the the Christian monk. When she when she hears from Maysara certain aspects of his noble character, and she sees that on top of all of that, he he brings back astronomical prophets. So Khadija alayhi salam, she offers the Prophet a rate that uh, she, she basically offered him double the rate that she would give to those who typically work, worked for her. So upon seeing the astronomical prophets Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi yielded for her, Khadija offered him twice the rate that she would give to others who worked with her. But of course, the Prophet Sallallahu refuses to take anything other than uh, the standard rate. You see that the Prophet Sallallahu does not want to be uh, given preferential treatment even when he deserves it. So again, you see glimpses of this, uh, of the magnanimous character of this man. That even when he's deserving of it, he insists on uh, receiving the standard rate. So the Prophet ﷺ, he takes his earnings and he does something else that's noble. So it's his money that he generates, but he gives it to Abu Talib. Why does he do that? Because Abu Talib was experiencing some financial hardships, potentially because of the, the droughts. He also had you know, a lot of children, a lot of mouths to feed. So the, the Prophet ﷺ really looked to Abu Talib as a father figure. And, you know, as a, as a dutiful son would do when he sees that his father is in, is in need, he hands over 
uh, all of his earnings to Abu Talib uh, Now, when Abu Talib senses that the, he could see the way that the Prophet is talking about Khadija, he notices the way Khadija speaks about the Prophet, you know, being a man of, of high emotional intelligence, Abu Talib senses that there is an attraction between Khadija and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And he actually recommends Rasulullah, he recommends his nephew to pursue a marital relationship with Khadija. You know, she is a woman of, of great dignity. She's a pious woman. And she's a perfect match for you. Meaning that you, you, you both come from noble families. You are both people of noble character and you work well together among you know the other uh, you know uh, points of attraction. Now, of course, the Prophet Sallallahu did not uh, go at, go and propose to her, perhaps you know because he was shy, because you know he felt that you know she you know uh, she, she occupied a very high uh, economic uh, status. For whatever reason, the Prophet Sallallahu does not actively pursue the relationship and and of course you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and throughout the life of the prophet he always puts him in a position of you know of the highest dignity where you know he's not the one who is uh who's pursuing so Khadija she she's attracted uh to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, and she decides to be proactive Instead of waiting for the marriage proposal to come to her, she sends Nufaysa, one of her servants, to propose to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi on her behalf. And of course, this is something that is that shatters the uh, the cultural norms of the time. So you see that you see the boldness. Of Khadija, she 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 sees uh, something unique about this man, and she doesn't wait for him to propose. She takes it upon herself to propose through her her servant. So you see again the modesty of Khadija. She doesn't just go up to the prophet. Not that that would negate her modesty, but she does it through uh, an intermediary. Now, of course, the, the Prophet Sallallahu accepts uh, the proposal. So there is an interest on both sides. And the wedding ceremony, uh, shortly after the proposal, the marriage, uh, the wedding ceremony is, is organized. And this is a narration from Imam al-Sadiq salam where he gives us some detail about the the wedding ceremony so the riwaya is from imam al-sadiq and abi abdullah alayhi salam and this narration is mentioned in al-kafi i'll give you the exact volume and page so imam al-sadiq he says lamma arada rasulullah ay yatazawwaj khadija bint khwailid aqbala abu talib when the Messenger of God wanted to marry Khadija bint Khuwaylid, Abu Talib proceeded with his household and some prominent members of the Quraysh حَتَّى دَخَلَ عَلَىٰ وَرَقَ إِبْنِ نَوْفَلْ فَابْتَدَأَ أَبُو طَالِبْ بِالْكَلَامِ So, they reached the home of Waraka ibn Nawfal. So the, the wedding ceremony took place in the house of Waraka, the, the cousin of Khadija, who was the, the Christian monk. And Abu Talib, he initiated the, the conversation. So there was an acceptance from both sides, but now they're kind of going through uh, some of the formalities. And Abu Talib, he walks in with uh, his family members. There are other prominent members of Quraysh. He walks in, everyone is seated, and then Abu Talib begins to speak. So what does he say? 
Imam al-Sadiq, he quotes uh, Abu Talib. So this is basically the, the, the speech that he gives uh, at the wedding ceremony, the khutbah of the, the nikah. فَقَالَ الْحَمْدُ لِرَبِّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ Praise is for the Lord of the Kaaba. الَّذِي جَعَلَنَا مِنْ زَرْعِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ وَذُرِّيَّةَ إِسْمَاعِيلِ وَأَنزَلْنَا حَرَمًا آمِنًا وَجَعَلْنَا, وجعلنا, ال, وجعلنا الْحُكَّامَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَبَارَكَ لَنَا فِي بَلَدِنَا الَّذِي نَحْنُ فِيهِ Abu Talib says, he begins his speech by saying, Praise is for the Lord of the Kaaba, who made us among the offspring of Ibrahim and the descendants of Ismail and placed us in this safe sanctuary and made us rulers over people and blessed us in this city in which we live. He then says, ثُمَّ إِنَّ ابْنَ أَخِي هَذَا Furthermore, this nephew of mine, meaning the Messenger of Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I want you to listen very carefully to the way that Abu Talib describes the Prophet. And I want you to ask yourself sincerely, does this sound like a man who died rejecting the nubu'ah of Rasulullah? So he says, he says, ثُمَّ إِنَّ ابْنَ أَخِي هَذَا مِمَّا لَا يُوزَنُوا بِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قُرَيْشِ إِلَّا رَجَحَ بِهِ This nephew of mine is a man who if measured against any man of Quraysh would tip the balance. Meaning that he's superior to any man from Quraysh. وَلَا يُقَاسُ بِهِ رَجُلٌ إِلَّا عَظُمَعًا my nephew, if he is compared not just to Quraysh, to any man, would prove to be greater. And then what does he say? وَلَا عِدْلَ لَهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ So not only is he the best of Quraysh, not only is he better than all other men, Abu Talib says, no match has he among God's creations, among God's creatures. So here is a testimony, a statement from Abu Talib. This is 15 years before the Prophet's Ba'tha, where he says that he essentially is saying that my nephew is Sayyidul Khalq. وَإِن كَانَ مُقِلًّا فِي الْمَالِ so no match has he among God's creatures, though he is poor in wealth. Now, he might not have the financial resources, but do not let his the scarcity of his wealth fool you into thinking that he is not the greatest of God's creatures. And then Abu Talib speaks about wealth. Essentially saying that wealth is not a determinant of a person's value. فَإِنَّ الْمَالَ رَفْدٌ جَار but, but then wealth comes and goes. وَظِلٌ زَائِدٌ Wealth is a fleeting shadow. وَلَهُ فِي خَدِيجَةَ رَغْبَةً وَلَهَا فِيهِ رَغْبَةً He says there is an attraction between Khadija and Muhammad and Muhammad and Khadija. He wants Khadija and Khadija wants him. وَقَدْ جِئْنَاكَ لِنَخْطُبَهَا إِلَيْكَ بِرِضَاهَا وَأَمْرِهَا وَالْمَهْرُ عَلَيَّ فِي مَالِ الَّذِي سَأَلْتُمُوهُ عَاجِلُهُ وَآجِلُهُ Abu Talib he then says, thus we have come to ask you, her guardian, you know, presumably her uncle, for her hand at her pleasure and request, meaning that we are here because she wanted to marry. She proposed to the Prophet. And they both are interested in marriage. And Abu Talib, he says, the bridal gift, which you have demanded, that which is due immediately and that which is due later, 
is on me to be paid. Abu Talib says that I will cover the mahar from my wealth, from my holdings. And then Abu Talib says, الْبَيْتِ He swears by Allah, the Lord of the Kaaba. وَلَهُ وَرَبِّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ حَظٌ عَظِيمٌ وَدِينٌ شَائِعٌ وَرَأْيٌ كَامِلٌ By the Lord of this house, by the Lord of Kaaba, this nephew of mine, he has great promise, a piety that is well known. He is known as a man of God, a man of righteousness, and an insight that is mature. He is, he is a man of basira. And then Imam al-Sadiq says, ثُمَّ سَكَتَ أَبُوْ طَالِبْ Then Abu Talib became silent. He, he, he finished his speech. وَتَكَلَّمَ عَمُّهَا وَتَلَجْلَجْ وَقَصْرَ عَنْ جَوَابِ أَبِي طَالِبْ Then Khadija's uncle, who was essentially her, her guardian, her, her uncle Amr, he tried to speak but was unable to match the eloquence and the beauty of Abu Talib's words. So Khadija stepped in and she said to him, Ya Amma, inna ka wa in kunta awla bi nafsi minni fi shuhud, falastu awla bi min nafsi. She says, Oh, uncle, while you are my guardian when I am absent, you are not my guardian when I am present. It seems that maybe the uncle said something that he was trying to make the the proceedings more complicated than they, than, than they needed to be. And Khadija basically intervenes and says that, you know, I'm here. No, you don't need to speak on my behalf. I can speak for myself. And she says, Muhammad nafsi, that I hereby marry myself to you, O Muhammad. And then what does she say? I propose to you and I want to pay the mahar to you. And the bridal gift is on me. Don't worry about the mahar. This is the same Khadija where the most wealthy businessmen in Arabia, they, they were begging her to accept their proposals. Here Khadija proposes to the Prophet And she says that the mahar is on me. The mahar is on me. And this is why you see that after the death of Khadija, in the seventh year after the hijrah, you see that when the Prophet is given fedak after conquering Khaybar as a settlement from the Jewish tribes, the Quran commands Rasulullah to give fedak to Fatima. And one of the reasons why he does this is that he says to Fatima that this is to to uh, this is to repay your mother for the mahar that she paid and for her service to Islam. And since you are the only surviving descendant of Khadija, it belongs to you. So Khadija alayhi salam says that the the bridal gift is on me. So here you see Khadija alayhi salam, she challenges some of the, the cultural norms. Number one, she proposes. Number two, she says, I'll, t I'll take care of the mahar, which is something that's unheard of. And then she says, فَأْمُرْ عَمَّكَ فَلْيَنْحَرْ نَاقَةً فَلْيُولِمْ بِهَا so, so this is uh, perhaps the uncle, the guardian of Khadija, who says, "Please," he says to the prophet, "Please request your uncle to slaughter a camel and make a wedding feast, a walima, out of it, and wadhul ala ahlik, and take up residence with your wife." Abu Talib, he then says, "Ashhadu alayha bi qabulha Muhammadan wa damanha wa damana al mahr fi malha." Abu Talib says that I bear witness 
that she, that Khadija has accepted Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as her husband and assumed the bridal gift on herself. Now, what happens next is interesting. Imam al-Sadiq says, when Khadija says that the bridal gift is on me, some of the Quraysh, some of the men who were attending the, the wedding ceremony, they, they make a snide comment. فَقَالَ فَقَالَ بَعْضُ قريش. Some of the Quraysh who were in attendance, they said, يَا عَجَبَا How strange is this? الْمَهْرُ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ للرجال. How strange is this? That the mahar, that bridal gifts are now being paid by the woman to the man? This is against our custom. Imam al-Sadiq says, فَغَضِبَ أَبُوْ طَالِبُ غَضَبًا شَدِيدًا When these men were essentially mocking what was happening, and they were essentially trying to belittle the Prophet, Abu Talib stood, he was angry and he stood up. وَكَانَ مِمَّنْ يَهَابُهُ الرِّجَالُ وَيَكْرَهُ غَضَبًا Abu Talib is the type of person that is feared when he's angry because Abu Talib is not easily angered. He's a person of hilm. He's a person of forbearance. So when, when he hears these comments, he stands up and he says, in response to those who are poking fun at this, the idea that the woman is paying the mahar. فَقَالَ إِذَا كَانُوا مِثْلَ بْنَ أَخِي هَذَا طُلِبَتِ الرِّجَالُ بِأَغْلَى الْأَثْمَانِ وَأَعْظَمِ الْمَهْرِ Abu Talib responds to them and he says, when the man is like my nephew, he is sought after with the most expensive gifts. وَإِذَا كَانُوا, بأم... وإذا كانوا أَمْثَالُكُمْ لَمْ يُزَوِّجُوا إِلَّا بِالْمَهْرِ الْغَالِي But when the man is like you people, no one marries them unless he gives her the most expensive gifts. Abu Talib is saying that the reason why this is rare is because it is not you, it, it is rare to find someone like Muhammad and he is deserving, he's worth it for a woman to spend whatever she has so that he can be her husband. So the mahar of this marriage was 12 and a half purses of silver. It was a very simple mahar. And each purse contained 40 dirhams. So 500 dirhams was the mahar for the wedding of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Lady Khadija. And 500 dirhams is basically 500 silver coins. So you see the, the simplicity of the mahar in this blessed marriage, and you see it repeated in the blessed marriage of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima to Zahra, following the example of the Prophet and Khadija. Now, how old was Khadija when she married the Prophet? Now, and, and was she married before? Now, in the Sunni tradition, the, Sun, the, the dominant view of Ahlul Sunnah is that Khadija was previously married and she was, she was a widow. She was previously married and some say that she was married to two men in the past and the Prophet is essentially her third husband. Now in the Shi'i tradition, we reject this and Khadija, according to the Shi'i view, was a virgin when she married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and again, not that there's anything wrong if, if a woman is a, if it was, was a widow or a divorcee. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, in his life he married uh, widows. So it, but we want to examine what the facts are. So... In the Sunni, in the, the Sunni view, asserts that Khadija was previously married, 
The Shia review argues that she was she was not married before she was a virgin when she married the prophet. Now her age. Now the common opinion in Muslim circles today, especially among the laity, is that she was 40 years old when she married the prophet and you know oftentimes the marriage of Rasulullah and Khadija is cited as an example where you have a young man marrying an older woman. And of course, Islamically, there's nothing wrong with a younger man marrying an older woman. But the question here is, was Khadija older than the Prophet? Was she 15 years older than the Prophet? Did she die at the age of 65? Now, this opinion was the opinion of Al-Waqidi, who was a Sunni historian, one of the classical scholars of the Sunni tradition. He was of the opinion that Khadija was 40 years old when she uh, when she married the Prophet. However, this is not the view of some of the more prominent Sunni historians and the Sunni Hadith scholars. Now, scholars unanimously agree that the marriage of Rasulullah and Khadija lasted for 25 years. They were married for 25 years before she died. And all ulama also unanimously agree that Rasulullah was 25 years old. So there's no ikhtilaf about the Prophet's age. The Prophet was 25 years old. Everyone agrees. All historians, Sunni scholars, Shia scholars agree Rasulullah was 25. And they all agree that the marriage lasted for 25 years. Now, There are more authentic reports, even in the Sunni tradition, that Khadija was not 40 when she married the Prophet. So academically speaking, there are a number of issues, there are a number of problems with the assertion that Khadija was 40 when she married the Prophet. So let me walk you through some important facts. So when we put this puzzle together, we, we, we come to the conclusion that she could not have been 40. For instance, Al-Bayhaqi, a, a Sunni scholar, who in his book, Dala'il al nubuwa Ibn Kathir, in his book, Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah, again, they're uh, Sunni classical Sunni historians, they all note, Ibn Kathir, Al-Bayhaqi, and others, they note that Khadija, alayhi salam, died at the age of 50. Waqidi said 65. But again, Waqidi is not of the same caliber as uh, Ibn Kathir and others. So you have more prominent, more credible scholars who are of a higher caliber in the Sunni tradition that say Khadija died at 50. Now the prevalent view among historians is that Khadija died in the 10th year after the Ba'tha. She died 10 years after the Prophet began his prophetic mission. So if, according to Ibn Kathir and Bayhaqi and others, if she died at 50, and, she, and if she died 10 years after the Prophet began his Ba'tha, we all know that the Prophet was 40 when he began his Ba'tha. So therefore, when you put these three facts together, you find that the more plausible position is that Khadija was the same age as the Prophet Furthermore, and we'll inshallah get into more detail because there's a dispute among ulama, especially even within uh, among the Shia ulama about how many children the Prophet had. Was Fatima his only child? It seems, and, and we'll get into more detail about this, it seems that Khadija and Rasulullah, they actually had six children together. And if, if someone argues that Khadija married the Prophet when she was 40, it's, it's highly unlikely that she could have given him that many children uh, uh, if she was at that age. So... Where does this idea come from that Khadija was this old woman 
uh, who married the prophet. She was 15 years uh, his senior. Now, it's possible, again, we don't know for sure, but it's definitely possible that these reports about the about Khadija being advanced in her years when she married the Prophet, they could stem from the jealousy that existed uh, among the wives of the Prophet towards Khadija. You know, and again, this is something that's well documented. You know, among the wives of the Prophet, Aisha was definitely uh, envious and jealous of Khadija. In fact, she admits it herself. Here's a tradition from uh, the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and I'll read to you the narration in, in Arabic and I'll, I'll translate it for you. So the narration is from Aisha. She says, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وآله إذا ذكر خديجة أثنى عليها فأحسن الثناء. She says that كان النبي that the Prophet used to always used to regularly mention and remember Khadija and he would lavishly praise her. He would praise her. قالت فغرت يوما. Khadija says that one day. I became jealous. I just, I, I couldn't take it anymore. I became jealous. Jealous. And she says to the Prophet, ما أكثر ما تذكرها That how, you mention her, how much are you going to mention her? And she says to the Prophet, قَدْ أَبْدَلَكَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ بِهَا خَيْرًا مِنْهَا Aisha says to the Prophet, that why you talk about Khadija so much and you praise her, Indeed, God has given you better wives than her. Allah has replaced her with better wives. Some of the narrations say that the Prophet ﷺ became so angry that he turned red. He says to Aisha, "Ma abdalani Allahu azza wa jal khayran minha." He says to Aisha that no, Allah has not given me anyone better than Khadija. She believed in me when other people denied me. And inshallah, we'll speak more about this uh, when we speak about the bi'tha and, and how supportive uh, Khadija was. He says that she, she believed in me when others rejected me. She put all of her wealth at my service when other people withheld theirs from me. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He granted me children through her. While I was, I have not been granted children who survived at least uh, with other wives. So you see the Prophet ﷺ highlighting that Khadija was the most dear to him, the most beloved to him. And there are certain renditions, there are certain versions of this narration where Aisha actually says that, you know, why do you constantly talk about that old woman? That old woman. So there are reports where Aisha describes her as an old woman. So this gives us a sense that perhaps some of these narrations were fabricated because of the jealous sentiments that some of the wise had uh, towards Khadija alayhi salam. Uh, with that, inshallah, we'll uh, conclude our discussion and uh, we'll continue our conversation on the, the life of Prophet Muhammad in our upcoming episodes. Thank you so much for tuning in, brothers and sisters, and I look forward to having you join me on another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ajil fajr. Any questions or comments? Actually, let me let me answer the questions that that were outstanding from uh, from our from our last session. So the first question that uh, was asked was. Uh, are related to the cause of the sacrilegious wars, Harbul Fijar. And, you know, when you look at uh, 
the historical accounts. Of course, the exact the specifics are disputed, but uh, it seems that one of the main reasons why this uh, these uh, battles took place, the sacrilegious wars occurred, was uh, fighting over control of trading routes. Because again, you know, in the same way countries today they fight over, you know, uh, you know, oil and, uh, you know, uh, so it seems that one of the reasons why the sacrilegious wars took place was uh, fighting over control of uh, of trade routes. Now, why why those? And we we mentioned that they were called the sacrilegious wars because the fighting took place uh, during these sacred months, where fighting and uh, uh, fighting and and any type of uh, military conflict was forbidden even by jahili standards. Now, what's the origin of the uh, of of designating these months as the uh, the sacred months? You know, some say that this is a remnant of the Sharia of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is possible, and uh, but it it also it also could be that that designating certain might certain months as sacred was done for economic reasons because as you know, you know Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and these are you know at least two of the four sacred months. It's a time where people prepare, make preparations for the pilgrimage, and actually perform the pilgrimage to Mecca. And Mecca, of course, the Hajj was an important source of revenue for the Arabs. So I can imagine for, for, for economic reasons, there was a suspension of fighting to ensure uh, the economic well-being of the region. And, of course, the other months perhaps were designated uh, to also allow the Arabs to conduct their, uh, their trading expeditions. So the combination of allowing time for the, 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 the Quraysh and the other tribes to conduct business and trade and also uh, preserve the, uh, the Hajj because Hajj was an important source of, of revenue. So I think a lot of it had to do with economic considerations because you know business does better when, 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 when it's safe, when it's secure, when there's no war. And it, but it also could be a remnant of the uh, the sacred law of Ibrahim. So maybe this is one part of the Sharia of Ibrahim that was preserved. Well, you know, unfortunately, most of it was uh, was distorted and changed. Any other questions or comments? If uh, Lady Khadija was only twenty five at the time of her marriage. Does this mean she inherited most of her empire? She, we don't know how much she inherited. She inherited the same, you know, that her siblings inherited. Of course, they, they squandered uh, a lot of their wealth, but uh, she invested. And you have to remember that 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 twenty five is is not young, meaning that presumably she had several years to kind of build on the inheritance that she received. So the wealth of Khadija was not just a matter of wealth that she inherited from her, her father, uh, because she was, she was much wealthier than her, her siblings and, and really all others in the region. So she, she had capital that she inherited, but she was, she was able to kind of uh, grow that capital uh, because of uh, her business savviness. And thank you. And about how much is 500 dirhams worth in today's dollars? I would say no more than a few hundred dollars, even less maybe. It's 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 a very small amount. I mean, 500. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I would I would have to do a calculation, but it's it's something that's that's no more than. You know, it, it could even be like a hundred dollars, one hundred fifty dollars. Definitely not in the thousands. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam, rahmatullah. How are you keeping, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. How are you? Alhamdulillah, 
from the well. Very, very informative and very in uh, insightful uh, presentation, mashallah. Uh, she had a question yeah. that Baraka uh, bin Nawafil, the cousin of uh, Sayyida Qadiyat al Kubra, yeah. question mark. Um, uh, that's what uh, even we say. Uh, but then the Christians claim that uh, since he was a Christian monk, uh, Sayyid Al-Qadid Al-Kubra would take uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to uh, Baraka bin Nawafil. And he would tutor him and uh, give him all the information of the past prophets and everything. And that is why the Messenger of Islam uh, claimed he got the, all the information from him uh, about the Bible and uh, about Torah and Zabur. And then he claimed to be a prophet. So he's uh, he shed some light on this. So, so I'll I'll actually be speaking about this in uh, in detail when we speak about the uh, about the Be'atha, because this is I mean this is one of the uh, refutations that are that are put forward by those who doubt that the Prophet ﷺ was a legitimate prophet. They say that he just he borrowed. The stories uh, from Ahlul Kitab, Waraka ibn Nawfal had uh, had some interactions with him. But inshallah, I'll go into more detail. But just as a quick uh, answer, if if you look at the the time that uh, that the Prophet spent with Waraka, we don't have any evidence that they spent substantial time with each other, uh, because Waraka, if if I recall, he he dies very shortly after the uh the Be'tha. so we don't have any evidence that he spent uh time with uh, waraqa because if he did you, you can imagine that this would have been used by his uh by his enemies by the quraysh because again you know quraysh is a very tight-knit community if it was known you know that the prophet in his 20s in his 30s was frequenting the house of waraqa who is a christian monk we would have we would have heard this accusation uh, directed uh, towards the prophet by the Quraysh throughout uh, his prophetic career, but because we don't hear that, that's an indication that there was little to there was very little uh, communication or, or interaction between the two. Um, Sheikh. Um... Sayyidah Qadir al-Kubra was a Hanif, right? Yeah. Her whole family was Hanif. So uh, this is my doubt. I think uh, Baraka bin Nawafil was also a Hanif, you know, but it's up to you whenever you have um, the other sessions, the upcoming sessions, please uh, clarify. In inshallah, we, we can, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, about the... Uh, about the personality of, of Waraka ibn Nawfal. I've even heard, I've even read some some Shi'i historians even doubt if if he was actually a real uh, uh, a real person. Some some even argue that that he he's a fictitious character. I I personally don't believe that he was. I think he, that he did exist, um, and it, it's 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 possible that you know Waraka was. Was Christian, but not a Christian who believed in uh, in the Trinity or that you know Jesus was uh, the uh, the Son of God. He was probably an historian in the sense that he believed Jesus to be a prophet of God. So his his aqidah, his theology would would probably not be the same as Christian theology as we see it today. So if he wasn't, you know, on Din al Hanif per se. It seems that he he did not subscribe to the traditional Christian theology that we know today. It's especially because it seems that you know he believed in uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, but for whatever reason, maybe he he concealed his he did not publicize his his belief of the Prophet. But uh, the comments that he makes. Uh, definitely show that he's sympathetic towards the prophet, and uh, and he, I mean, he he very clearly corroborates the the prophecies of uh, of of the you know the monk 
the Christian monk that Mesra came in contact with. Just, uh, and what what business did Lady Khadija have? I mean, she she was she would buy and sell goods. You know, everything from garments to to spices, whatever was bought and sold uh, at that time. You know, uh, she, you know, camel skins, what whatever it may be, textiles pottery we don't know exact we don't have details about what her inventory was but whatever was typically uh, bought and sold and, and bartered at the time and and just one clarification that's being asked uh, was the mahar from Bibi Khatija to the prophet so it seems that there was an agreement about what the uh, the mahar would be and she basically, it seems that she just forfeited it, meaning that she'll cover it. You know, don't don't worry about uh, the mahar. So when she says, well, maharu alayya, that the bridal gift is on me, it's not clear if she's saying that I'm giving the bridal gift to the prophet or is she saying that I'm just forfeiting it. It seems that she gave it to the prophet because of the reaction of uh, the... Uh, the, the some of the members of Quraysh who were in attendance. It seems that she gifted the Prophet the uh, the gift. So she either just forfeited her mahar, or she actually gave the gift to uh, to the Prophet. And just from the context, from the reaction of of the those Qurayshi men who were there, and the the response of Abu Talib. Uh, uh, it seems that she she actually gifted him. Thank you very much. Ahsanto, thank you so much. And inshallah, we will continue our discussion next week, bi'idhnillah.